The Soldier is a poem written by Rupert Brooke and it's a poem that expresses strong nationalistic pride. However, as you can see there, I've already started to analyse that poem. So there's part one of my analysis of The Soldier and this is part two. So watch that bit first. So with that out of the way, here is part two. Liam from the future here. As you can see, this is where we left off in part one of my analysis of Rupert Brooks' The Soldier. I hope you had enough time to look at those questions and think about them and maybe make your own annotations. But now I'll pass back over to Liam in the video and he'll go through some of his ideas. Of course, you are welcome to use the comments section to add in your own ideas. Uh, believe me, I'd love to see that dialogue happening down there. Anyway, Liam, over to you. The use of caesura, so the plural of caesura, helps to slow down the pace of the poem, creating a reflective tone. We see in the Sestet that the persona considers what it can give back to England through sacrificing their life defending it, suggesting that they are aware that they could pay the ultimate price. If I were you, I might be inclined right now to highlight any other examples of caesura in this stanza to reinforce the annotation that you've just made. The comma in the middle of the second line would be a good place to start. The final few lines show the things that the persona will return to England upon their death. Sights and sounds, happy dreams and laughter. All of these things are positive, which in turn presents England as positive, as they originated there. In fact, England is almost presented as idyllic, or as the origin of all worldly happiness. As it says on the slide, peace contrasts with the chaos of war, showing that the persona is aware that the battlefields they will soon enter will be far from nice, and that the release of death may be their eventual way out of it. English heaven is a very positive and almost euphemistic image to end the poem with. It is, of course, associated with death. It's impossible to reach heaven otherwise. But it also suggests that by dying for their country, the persona is dying in glory and is dying for all the right reasons. They even describe heaven as English, because for them, heaven absolutely has to be English. This image sums up the persona's overall attitude towards war and their possible death. The harsh realities of war are not discussed in this poem, perhaps because the poet had no experience of them. But dying for your country is explored in this poem. In fact, dying for your country is glorified. This poem expresses a jingoistic viewpoint, turning this poem into something similar to propaganda. And now we're looking at the poem as a whole. I think it's worth considering how language has been used in a specific way across the poem. And that is how it's been used to present England as a utopia. If you're not familiar with that word, a utopia is a perfect world or place, although it is often imaginary. If you want to think about this on your own first, now is a great time to pause the video. On the screen now are some of the words, phrases, or lines that present England as a utopia. They present it as superior, as seen in Richard Dust, pure, as seen in All Evil Shed Away and Air, clean, 
as shown by Washed by Rivers, Jolly as shown by Dreams as Happy as Her Day and also Laughter, Peaceful as shown by Gentleness, and Eden-like as shown by Flowers, Roaming, Blessed and Heaven. All of this combines to create the impression that England is a utopia, or in other words, Brooke has used a semantic field of utopianism in his presentation of England, reflecting the patriotic thoughts of a soon-to-be soldier. And now I think it's useful to consider the poem's overall form. So to what extent is this poem a sonnet? I've put the conventions of a sonnet up on the screen just in case you've forgotten our discussion of sonnets from my Sonnet 43 video, or if you've not got around to watching that one yet, which you should probably do. If you want, pause the video now and evaluate the poem based on the typical conventions of a sonnet. This poem is clearly a love poem. It's not necessarily romantic, a lovey-dovey love, but it clearly expresses an admiration and adoration for England. I'm no maths teacher, but there's definitely 14 lines in this poem. This poem is generally written in iambic pentameter. In my reading of it, lines six, seven, 11, and 14 are all 11 syllables rather than 10. And interestingly, each of those lines relate to what England has given the persona or what they are looking to give back. And so perhaps that could suggest that England has given so much to the persona and that they want to give so much back. Yep, the poem's octet establishes that there's a soldier who might die and that they don't worry about it because they're going to do it for England, who gave them so much. Yep, there is indeed a volta. There's a, a clear stanza break across which the rhyme scheme changes, and there's also a slightly different topic in the sestet. The sestet here shifts the focus of the poem. It's changed from what England has given to the persona and is now focused on what the persona wants to give back to England. And from the perspective of the rhyme scheme, this poem does indeed follow one of the variations of the typical sonnet rhyme scheme. So overall, this poem is pretty much the perfect sonnet, reflecting not only the persona's love for England, but just how perfect they think England is too. And that's the whole poem analysed in depth. So now we're going to consider the three M's of the poem. Now, if that means nothing to you, I recommend that you have a quick look at the first video in this series, which is for Simon Armitage's The Manhunt. So if I've worked YouTube correctly, a link for that video should be appearing on screen about now. And so there's my overall summary of the poem. I've said prior to fighting in World War I, a soldier reassures the reader by telling them that if they are going to die, they're going to do it for England, showing patriotic views that are characteristic of pre-war England, and so on. So I've tried to summarise the whole poem, as well as include a bit of context too. And those are my comments about the poem's mood. I've said it's celebratory, uh, as the persona is listing all of the positive qualities that England possesses, such as its flowers and ways to roam. That's a mood that could also be seen as very patriotic. And finally, there's my ideas about Brooke's motivation for writing this poem. Do you think it's fair for me to say that he wrote this poem for propagandistic purposes? Or do you see this poem as something with a bit more artistic integrity. Please let me know what you think in the comments section down below. Here we've got the theme table. 
Again, I've explained this in my second video of this series, the second part of my analysis for Simon Armitage's The Manhunt. In short, I reckon you're going to find it useful to produce a pretty large table for these themes with a row for each of the 18 anthology poems. If I was filling out the grid, this is what I might have done. I don't think that this poem is overtly focused on power, although you could be crafty and say that it's the, I don't know, about the power of love or the power of patriotism or, or something. Although there are a few references to nature in the poem, the poem itself I don't think is actually about nature, and so I wouldn't call it a nature poem. However, seeing as this poem is a sonnet, and that devotion for England is apparent throughout, I definitely say that this is a love poem. This is a war poem, it's about a soldier after all, but it's an interesting war poem, as there's very little about actually fighting. Remember, Brooke never fought in battle, which is perhaps why this poem isn't necessarily about that fighting. This poem contrasts in loads of interesting ways with some of the other war poems. Although this poem is very clearly set around a certain time, World War I, I don't think it overtly focuses on that. World War I is more of a setting or background than something right at the front of this poem. This poem is definitely about place. I mean, think about the amount of times that England is mentioned. I think this is a poem about man, either a man or a group of men, and it's about their relationship with their country. Death is something that is foregrounded in the poem's first line, and although we don't see the soldier actually die, their preparation for death is there and could bring up an interesting analysis. Although there are the religious allusions in this poem, I don't know if I feel comfortable calling it a religion poem. I could definitely be convinced otherwise though, as there is an almost devotional side to this poem, so maybe it could be considered religious. I'm sort of a bit on the fence here. So those are my thoughts about the themes that could apply to this poem. But what do you think? Let me know how you'd fill out this grid in the comment section down below. War is a theme that comes across strongly in this poem. To help you think about comparison, I reckon it would be useful for you to produce some sort of scale as I've suggested on the screen. If one is most negative and 10 is most positive, you could use this to put all of the war poems on. Don't just write the names of the poems though, back up why you've put them, where you've put them. A bit of explanation, including some context and definitely at least one quotation will help you out here. In fact, it could look something like that. As you can see, I've given the name of the poem and poet and a score out of 10. I've given an explanation using some context and even used a short quotation. At this stage, it doesn't matter if you don't know what all of the war poems are, because this is something that you can go back to time and time again and add to or amend or tweak. Once you've studied or revised all of the anthology poems, then this is something that I think you should really come back to and complete. There we go. That is the soldier done. If this video has helped you in any way, then please do give it a like and subscribe to my channel and turn on that notification bell because if I've helped you with this poem, then there's another 17 anthology poems that I'll be able to help you with too. And that's before I've covered any of the other lit texts. Do drop a comment too. You're welcome to add in any of your own bits of analysis or to ask me any questions that you might have about this poem. Adding a comment also helps with the YouTube algorithms. 
if this video has helped you, then you can help me to help even more people by liking, commenting, etc., so that it will be recommended to even more people. So, have an awesome rest of the day, and remember to take frequent breaks as you revise, because a burned out student is not a happy or successful student, and happy and successful are things that I want you to be. So, if you were about to go fight for your country, what sort of poem might you write? Well, if you're anything like Rupert Brooke, you're going to write a poem that expresses your immense nationalistic pride. And that's something that could be considered a sincere love poem, or that could be something that's considered to be nothing more than propaganda.